Right, hi guys. Well, uh, welcome to all of you. Um, it's a it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak to you. It's been a pretty tough time for everybody. <clears throat> we're all adapting pretty well. Um, if any of you need help or advice from us, we we here, um, sitting in very casual clothes at my desk. My glasses are 105 rand glasses from Clicks, as I stepped on mine uh, about two days into the lockdown. Uh, but let's get on with the presentation. Um, I've got quite a few slides here with quite a bit of detail so that the presentation can be, um, can be self-standing without me talking to it. And um, there's too much for me to talk through and some slides I'm literally going to make one point and move on. Uh, but you're all welcome to get a copy of the presentation. The BCI guys have got it or you can chat to your, uh, anybody you know at Anchor to get a copy of the presentation. So what are we saying now from an equity perspective? I think our overriding perspective, and, and this kind of pervades through our time, is we want to buy great businesses at good prices. When the market crashes, you get the opportunity to buy great businesses much cheaper. Um, so we're certainly not being tempted into things we wouldn't otherwise buy. Uh, but at the same time, this does provide a nice opportunity. Volatility prevails. Um, the US market running up and the SA market running up over the course of the last two weeks has created a bit of FOMO. It's a fear of missing out. But we are in uncharted territory, and if anything, we're acting with caution. We think that offshore equity has bounced a little bit too much in the short term, um, but in specific shares, there's still big upside opportunity. As uh, Peter and uh, Nolan pointed out, there's very little yield available offshore outside of emerging markets, and the RAND is extremely undervalued. And the risk to RAND-based investors, obviously if the RAND comes back from 19 to 15, it's going to erode any returns in offshore markets. So that's something that we're dealing with with, with quite a bit of caution. We think the local equity markets, in, from a direction point of view, will follow global markets. Um, but when the dust settles and things normalize, which it will, um, we'll look back to there being some excellent investing opportunities. So in our equity portfolios, we're not running for the hills and taking all the risk off the table. Uh, we, we, along with everybody, have taken a whack in the market. <clears throat> and we want to make sure that we're fully exposed to the upside of the market when it does come around. So we're not taking a one or two week view. Uh, we're looking through on a six month plus view. And importantly, the US earnings season is underway, which is giving us a lot of pointers as to what's going on. Uh, the bank earnings are very important. We saw JP Morgan provide an additional $6 billion. They have to look into the future and try and predict. They have subsequently um, worsened their economic trajectory. So you should expect to see more of that. But to put it in context, last year, JP Morgan made $36 billion bottom line. So a six or 12 or $20 billion provision doesn't take them into loss making territory. So, you know, these businesses, if you look out 12 and 24 months time, um, the balance sheets will not be destroyed like this compared to uh, the US to the GFC. So what we said back at the, at the beginning of 2020 um, is the, uh, is the S&P was looking fairly overvalued, moderately overvalued, but earnings growth would be strong. Um, so we still thought you could get a low dollar return from, from global equities, but we were pretty cautious. At the beginning of the year, we thought the fair value for the S&P was about 3,000 to 3,200. So what's happened since then? The S&P went up to 3,400, it plunged to 2,400, which is 30%, and then retraced back to 2,800. Given the fact that a lot of earnings will be wiped out this year, um, you know, we think the S&P is probably worth 5 to 10% less than what it was at the beginning of the year. One year of zero profits followed by normality coming through over the next 24 months, you know, probably puts a fair value down 10%. The S&P is now only down 12.5% for the year. So we, we do think it's kind of in fair value territory in aggregates. A lot of that is the tech shares holding up pretty well and quite a big recovery. But we do think there, there's a fairly good chance, and I think it's a broad consensus, which scares me a bit, um, that you know, the market's due for, for some, uh, some continued pullbacks and volatility. Uh, within the indexes, there are still some great share opportunities. You can still buy some great businesses at good prices and at cheap prices, um, but we're acting with some caution, and we want to make sure we've got cash available to take advantage when those opportunities come, uh, come off. It's not a time for ETFs. I think, you know, here's a time that one can differentiate from a, especially offshore, from, a, from an equity perspective. The reality is the job losses in America are extreme. Uh, this picture I got this morning of the internet, 22 million jobs lost. And if you compare that to all the other crises, 
it's kind of 10 times higher. So there's no way this won't have an economic impact. The impact can pass. And I guess the good news is a lot of this is in sectors. Uh, when they return to normal, people will get, will get hired again. Um, but analysts really have no idea what company earnings will be in the next 12 months. Some companies, like the stay-at-home companies, Amazon, Alibaba, Tencent, Netflix, etc., cetera, um, gaming companies, Naspass, um, have held up extremely well. Uh, Naspass is at a record high if you include process. So while we think these are interesting companies to be invested in over the long term, in fact, our favorite sector, um, right now from a snapback opportunity, it's obviously not the companies um, that are higher than they were at the beginning of the year. This slide just shows that there's been a lot of difference between different sectors in terms of performance. And to play the recovery, um, just to reiterate very strongly, we, we would never change our thesis of long-term high-quality growth companies, but there is place for a bit of a snapback recovery-type portfolio in good companies. So we've run a filter looking at uh, high return on equity companies, companies with good track records, um, companies that have grown their earnings and dividends every year and identified some of those. So they're finding our way into our portfolios. For your clients who, who've got offshore share portfolios, uh, we're very happy to run this as a portfolio for them. I've then included our, um, our various equity offerings, global equity offerings. Uh, the Anchor BCI Global Equity Feeder Fund, I think at the end of February, well, the end of March, it was in the top five uh, funds in the country, and that's performed very well. Our Global Technology Fund, which we launched last year, and is also obviously held up very well in RAND terms, and that sector has performed particularly well. And then from a local perspective, David Gibb runs our Worldwide Flexible Fund, which hasn't done as well um, in this, in, in this time period, because it's had quite a lot more financial than tech exposure, but that also augurs pretty well for the future and makes the snapback potential of this portfolio fairly promising. So there's our proposed recovery portfolio. I'm not gonna go through it, but it shares like Starbucks. We think affordable luxury will come back. Um, Striker, which is uh, joints, knees, spines, implants. You know, the demand for that, if you look at that little chart at the top, um, sales have grown every year virtually forever. Um, and if, if demand reduces, it's just demand delayed. It's not demand lost. Cisco, the biggest U.S. food distributor, fantastic quality business, generally at a 20, 25p multiple. You can now buy it at an 11. It might well make a loss this year. Um, but if you look back in two years' time, we think uh, a great investment. Moving through to the JSE, there's great value emerging. We are acting with caution. In the equity fund, we are fully exposed to things coming back. We're not going to try and be too clever and time the market coming off another 5 or 10% and then bouncing back and seeing through the volatility. Um, this is a fund you should expect to capture the recovery. Um, although what we've made sure of is that we've got little exposure to the high-risk high risk places. There's obviously lots of businesses which will have zero turnover or lots of bad debts, um, which will permanently, well, have, a, have a permanent impact on the balance sheet. We've avoided those. <clears throat> so the SA, SA equity market uh, has been a tough place for the last five years, as we all know. We've all battled with our clients, um, and it's been hard to bang the drum on equities here for quite some time. But given the value that's emerging, as well as where the currency sits and an expected uh, kick, uh, you know, comeback from the currency over a reasonable time period, um, you know, we, we, we'd be quite comfortable putting some money into the SA market. Some of the opportunities we see um, in an offshore basket, some great opportunities offshore um, with the RAND hedged. MTN I'll talk about. Uh, Bidcorp, we love as a business. It's going to go through a very tough time now. So we actually sold our Bidcorp shares. Um, but at some stage in the next one to 12 months, we'll, we'll buy them back. Bidvest. And then shifting into more cyclical shares when normalization becomes evident. We're certainly not increasing risk in our portfolio, but there's a try and time to try and capture the recovery, but we'd need to see some evidence of that happening. MTN is a great example for me and a business that I've got uh, a lot of conviction in at this price level. First of all, telecoms, telecoms com uh, companies around the world have been a safe haven. If you look at Vodacom at the bottom of the slide, the price is actually up for the year. But in the case of MTN, and largely because of the oil price and the impact of Nigeria, the price has halved. So if you assume that the South African business is the same as uh, Vodacom and the prospects are very similar, 
You've been punished by more than, than the entire Nigerian business in the MTN share price. The, the share price has halved. It's the cheapest it's ever been. If you look at the chart on the right-hand side, it's 1.8 times uh, EV EBITDA, and its average is five and a half. To uh, put that in comparison, Vodacom's EV EBITDA is 5.5. So it's a six and a half PE and a forward 13 and a half percent dividend yield. I put a caveat to that. They might not be able to pay all or, um, or some of the dividend that they've promised. We think that would only be a one year scenario. But this thing's acting like an oil proxy, and it's not an oil business. It's uh, Nigeria's 27% of the business. I had a l- long conversation with Rob Shuter, the CEO of uh, MTN, yesterday. And, you know, I kind of got the picture that the big risk in Nigeria is actually the currency weakening, and they've got some dollar costs. But those costs are primarily kind of equipment, towers, maintenance, etc. In times like these, they cut right back, right back on that. But it's not, it's not a case of the Nigerian business going into losses. Uh, our sense is maybe the profits can go down 20 or 30%. <clears throat> so this is not an all fall down scenario, but you're buying the share effectively at half price. So I think it's fairly conservative to forecast more than 50% upside from the share. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't uh, forecast the time period with as much confidence, um, but this is, uh, th- this is a rock solid business. Around the world, this theme has been strong. Um, but unfairly impacted uh, by the market crash and the Nigerian story. From an anchor perspective, um, year to date, we're down a very uncomfortable 20%, um, you know, but, but we, do, we do remain kind of fairly benchmark cognizant and, uh, and, and fully invested. Our belief is if people want to buy into equities, um, you know, we, we, we give them equity exposure. Um, I've got a little chart on the right-hand side, just saying April month to date, um, we're ahead of the market, and if the market, when and if and when the market bounces back, which it will eventually, we want to make sure that we regain all of that upside. Our non-JSC portfolio is um, is about eighteen percent. This is against a SA benchmark. Um, you know, we, we we're currently thinking about taking that up to thirty, but doing a rand hedge. But you can see in the offshore side, we've largely been in the right shares. So our current uh, positioning is still well balanced. Um, everything that everybody freaks out about in South Africa, you can see what you call our large cap new dawn portion, is 26% of the portfolio. So you know, one mustn't just focus on, uh, on SA in this. Is effectively the SA economy, there's about 26% exposure. We're keeping to that. Um, and, the, uh, and we might well increase that if and when we see very positive signs from the SA economy, because those companies are trading very cheaply. Um, on the right-hand side, I've just tried to share some of the, uh, <clears throat> some of the questions and uh, things that we're thinking about in our investment portfolios. Um, I think in the areas that we've underperformed this year is we've had a lot of financials, but I think financials are strong and you will see a bounce back. And we've clearly articulated our investment philosophy where typically we don't own uh, too much in the, well, we don't own stuff in the gold space. We think those are bad businesses over time. And there's quite a bit of risk. I mean, it's, it's a big debate in our, you know, whether to, whether to push that, you know, push over that line. Um, but so far we've, you know, peop- we want people to know what they're buying when they buy into our fund. Um, but, you know, certainly if, if things continue to flatten, uh, the currency comes back and gold comes back. Um, there's quite a lot of risk in gold, although, we do acknowledge that there's a lot of upside optionality at the moment, and it's a difficult one to call. So just to tie up what we're saying now, our overriding perspective has and will always be to buy great businesses at good prices. And we can buy great businesses at very good prices at the moment. We think volatility will prevail. And we think it's quite reasonable to expect the offshore market coming off a bit and remaining volatile, but there are underlying shares which present opportunities. Um, there's little yield available offshore outside of emerging markets. The RAND is extremely undervalued, and the risk to RAND-based investors uh, when it strengthens is quite big. So like in our, in our worldwide flexible fund, David Gibb is starting to put in some RAND hedges, which is very seldom done in the past. The local equity market will continue to bounce around. We've got caution. We're not uh, acting to, we're not acting, um, you, know, you know, we think the op- we're waiting for opportunities. And the local bond market looks very interesting at kind of CPI plus six. Um, So just to end with the fact that this crisis will pass like others have. um, And I think from a a people point of view, 
probably the most promising thing for me is that uh, for the first time in a long time, you've got everybody in the world focused on solving one problem. And betting against this is a bet against human ingenuity, which eventually does win. It's a rocky road, and it's taking some people's lives on the path along it. It's very unpleasant, um, but we will get through this. <laughs>